Welcome to Birdsong. I'm your host, as always, Kayu Kiora, and in this episode, we have Biata Alfoldi joining us. Biata is an international retreat leader, medicine woman, workshop facilitator, author, shamanic practitioner. She's a sound healer, a ceremonial leader, a seer, and a speaker with a gift for assisting individuals through deep transformation. Biata has long traveled the world for training and formal study in the areas of earth-centered practices, shamanism, eco-psychology, mind-body counseling, energetic healing, ceremonial work, and plant medicines. She facilitates private sessions, classes, workshops, and international retreats in Australia, Bali, and Mexico. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy our conversation and I trust that there will be some gemstones in here, some value to carry with you on your own path forward. I think it's so necessary because uh, we were heading in a really, I wouldn't say the wrong direction, but it was certainly not aligned with the values of earth and nature and things like that. So, um, you know, we keep praying and we keep praying and envisioning the highest timeline. That's what that's what I'm doing. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. well, look, let's just roll straight into it. You've just finished up with one of your medicine retreats, which we are for sure going to talk about. But I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that you are in a place right now, deeply connected to heart, to soul, to spirit, to nature. So it's a prime embodied place to be to dive straight into one of these first themes that I love to invite guests to speak on, which is honoring the sacred. So my invitation to you, Beata, is to share a few words or a prayer or whatever comes to you right now in this moment to open up our time and our space together in a similar light to how you might offer reverence to the sacred before ceremonial or ritual space. And secondly, just what it really means for you to be in a place of remembering the sacred ways and what it means for you to honor the sacred. Mm, Wow. That's a beautiful question to begin with. Um, Caillou, for me, honoring the sacred is obviously I've just come out of a a, a week long medicine retreat where we we were working with the sacred plant medicine of Wachima and I kept on sharing with the participants that were with us that through our songs and through our prayers and through our intentions sitting around the fire, which, as you know, has been replaced by the television, this is how we pray. This is how we honour the sacred to recognise that each one of us, that every rock, that every tree, that every body of water, every landscape that we walk upon is sacred. Um, and to continue to embody that with our la- in, in our lives and through the medicine of the heart, you know, for me, that's the connecting force uh, that, that is going to change all of our connections, not only with ourselves but with our brothers and sisters. And, um, and through the song, you know, I love singing. I love praying to spirit in that way. Um, it just brings me great joy. And, and to see the wind change and to see the, tree, the leaves on the tree start moving when we're, when we're singing together, when we're praying together and birds starting to sing, um, it really becomes the symphony, the symphony of life. And it allows us to remember that we're not separate from nature. Mm. Yeah, that disconnect. It is a big one. And I've been musing on what the sacred means to me lately. And I tend to see it from two different angles. From one, as you say, everything is sacred. Absolutely everything is sacred because all is part of the grand cosmic creation. But from another lens, not everything is sacred. The plastic in the ocean, sure, that's not sacred. You know, when you go for a walk in the forest and you see empty cans or litter thrown around. So in one sense, all is sacred, but from another, yeah, there's a, there's certain, and I guess that's where we make that duality between the sacred and the profane. But I, I love everything you have to say there. And, and, and this is a great point that you're bringing up. Um, it's, it's what we humans are doing to the environment that is bringing us away from our essential nature. And, and that the disconnect from the natural world, from most people living in cities and, and you know, four world constructions, um, allow us to disconnect from the natural world. So throwing a cigarette butt if someone smokes or a piece of plastic or or anything like that, as you said, is is a real disconnect from that essential nature that we all are. And 
as you know, I, I feel like one of the reasons that shamanic earth center practices and the plant medicine work, as well as the, the work of all ceremonies, brings us back and continues to bring us back to the old ways and to the ways that all of our ancestors honored life, the cycles of life, including birth and death, and had a very intimate relationship with those processes, which we are, uh, so much of the Western world particularly, is has become shut off from. Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. And one of the most potent ways to facilitate this reconnection is through the plant medicine work, which we're both involved in in one way or another. So let's talk about Jaguar Spirit, the Wachuma retreat that you facilitate in Tulum, Mexico, but... Firstly, I would love to hear you speak on your relationship with Wachuma, the sacred ancestral cactus medicine from the Andes Mountains of South America. So in what way has your relationship to this medicine, Wachuma, blossomed, evolved, matured over time, you know, from the early days of working with this medicine up until now where you are in the role of medicine woman, holding a space for others and facilitating these experiences? So, Caillou, I, I came across, or Wachuma found me around 14, 15 years ago. I was in the process of going through my second year, a diploma in shamanic and energetic healing at the Awareness Institute in Sydney at the time. And one of my teachers, Suzanne Luan, said, would you like to come uh, to the International Shamanism conference in the Amazon, the International Amazonian and Shamanism Conference in, in Iquitos. And I said, of course, and this is where the plant medicine kingdom really opened up to me. And of course, I tried ayahuasca and all sorts of other plant medicines whilst I was there in Peru, and I lived there for quite a while. Um, but Wachuma, as soon as I, I drank the medicine of Wachuma, I immediately felt a connection with this, with the spirit of this particular plant. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people that work with the medicine call it the grandfather. I don't see the medicines in that way at all. For instance, in other, in other countries, they call uh, Wachuma the uh, Aguacoya, which is the uh, water queen. And for me, um, this particular plant has no gender in, at times. I feel a very feminine presence with this plant and other times a very masculine presence, depending on the processes that I'm going through. And so I started off drinking the medicine for my own personal use and healing. And then I trained with a Peruvian uh, medicine man. And over the last two years, I've been uh, uh, co-facilitating and holding space um, as well as uh, supporting through my medicine songs, through my music. And actually just this last retreat, I stepped into an entirely different space where I uh, w cooked the medicine myself for 10 hours and really worked with prayers and intentions and then was able to serve the medicine. And that was an entirely different uh, stepping in and claiming of my own gifts and my own path of service. And uh, I, I'm, I have to say I'm very grateful because you know this for yourself, darling, the level of healing and transformation, the level of love and more importantly, a return to ourselves that we see. And I know that you would see it in your work as well. Um, I, I just, I, I, after every ceremony, I just pinch myself because every retreat, it's like I get to do the work that I love in, in, I could have chosen anything, um, but one of the things that I love is to facilitate transformation and real empowerment in people's lives because I really believe that when an individual is empowered, they're going to make very different choices in their life and, and in relationship to other people, the plant kingdom, as well as animals and our earth. So for me, facilitating that type of transformation and awareness and empowerment is paramount to the collective uh, awakening that we are seeing right now, even in the midst of what seems to be the crumbling of, and is actually the crumbling of old structures. So mm -hmm. I've really stepped into this path um, as a medicine woman in my own right and, and work in a way that feels authentic to me. And that's really important in all of the work that I facilitate, not only the plant medicine work, but the other work that I facilitate with women and men. 
Um, it, it is about taking all these teachings, receiving all the gifts of these teachings, but then making them my own. Mm. What I would love to hear you speak on is the way in which you articulate what or who Wachuma is to people that don't have a solid reference point for this, because I have many, many ways of languaging Wachuma as a plant medicine. It's it's heart medicine, it's awakening medicine, it's contemplative medicine, it's feeling medicine. It's just, for me, it's so many different types of medicine. But the most, the most, uh, the deepest way, or perhaps the, what am I trying to language here? For me, at its core, Wachuma is all about connecting back to the, to the heart of nature. And the heart <laughs> of nature is the heart of us. Absolutely. One mind, one heartbeat. That's it. So here, you know, I work with the Andean altar in in all of my ceremonies. And the final doorway, we come back to the doorway of the heart. And for me, it is that connection with the fire element within and without, remembering that we are children of the sun. And for me, Wachuma is definitely the doorway to the heart and really learning to walk that shamanic path and being able to see with the eyes of the heart rather than with the the eyes that we were taught in the education system which is these two eyes um as as you said so beautifully Caillou it connects us with the medicine of ourselves and we remember that love is the most powerful force on the universe and if you've ever been to a birth which you would have with your daughter and to a death as I've been to both and and fortunate enough to 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 help someone my mother transition and also welcome my son in, in into that space and also see him transition as well love is the only thing that matters in the end that is all no matter what story no matter what relationship we've had with uh, anyone whether it's an animal or a person it's the love that we experienced and it's the love that continues to 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 bring us back to our hearts and actually to our knees in reverence for the sacred in those in those really primal moments in life that we're actually all going to experience at one time or another. So this is the this is why I love this medicine so much um, because it brings each of us back to our hearts and to the power of love. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean the hippie woo woo way. I mean the real power of love to transform anything. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, look, clearly there is a need for the re-emergence of shamanism. And I suspect that you hold a very similar perspective here when it comes to your deep connection with shamanism. And for me, it's when I peel back the layers, you know, we've, there has the saying go, there's many paths up the mountain, but the the view from the top all looks the same. It's like, yeah, that's a, it's a, I appreciate the sentiments, but we could also argue that the view from the top is certainly not all the same because, as you say, there's many different ways of seeing. You can see through the eyes through our head, the eyes from the heart. But what I want to get at is, although there are many different paths, for me, when I strip back the layers, shamanism is really pointing to the deepest roots that I can find, which is that deep connection to nature. And for me, that's what it's all about. It's coming back to the roots. But with you know, even though there's this, this reemergence is evident, you know, it's obvious to you, it's obvious to me, uh, with this integration of the ancient and the modern, there are certainly risks involved here, you know, some of which revolve around this work being misunderstood, there's a lot of the prohibition and the nonsensical laws, there is the destabilizing potential that this work can bring on if people aren't engaging with them in an appropriate context. But there's also the dilution of shamanism as well. And this is something that I wanted to get your thoughts on because, you know, we live in a place where it's it's a fast-paced culture. It's a give-it-to-me-now culture. And because of that, there can certainly be the tendency to, well, for these ancient ways to kind of be brought into these modern times with a kind of superficial flavoring if you will, you know, kind of lacking depth. So I'd love to hear what your reflections are when it comes to walking the path of shamanism and integrating the ancient with the modern in a respectful way, in a deep way. So, you know, what do you see when it comes to the superficiality of shamanism in today's world and 
what gaps do we need to really bridge to bring it through with integrity? This is a this is a wonderful question, and it's a full question, and there's so many thoughts that I have around this. I think for any of us or anyone that is truly being called to work with either plant medicines or shamanic earth-centered practices in a deep way, um, my my suggestion is to realize that this is never a quick fix. If if someone is just wanting to get out of it or to have a, a, a psychedelic experience, um, this is definitely not not the prayer that I would have and certainly not what I carry within. It's this, you know, this work is incredibly serious to hold space for people, to hold psychic space and psychological space and emotional space, physical space. Uh, for people that are going through deep transformation requires years and years of training. Um, it requires that we don't just you know, work this path because it's the trendy thing to do and to realise that the integration and the preparation before any ceremony is equally as vitally as important because I have seen so many people walking this medicine path and they don't walk the talk. Uh, their lives never change. Um, they seem to be in perpetual drama and chaos and... For me, that's, that's when the medicine is not working for us. It's working against us. And somehow we haven't developed a correct relationship with the plant medicine or with the particular path that you are choosing within the shamanic walk. And there are many, as you know. So um, there's a fine line between the commercial aspect of, this, of, this, of all plant medicines and, and actually seeking out an experienced and diligent practitioner. And when I say that, it's, it's, I always say to people, watch how that person lives their life. You know, it's one thing to be loving and beautiful and an amazingly an incredible facilitator, but how does that person speak to the rubbish man? How does that person speak to the waitress? How does that person interact with their loved ones? Are they absolutely in integrity? Have they got their sexual energy um, in a space where it's not just going all over the place? And we know what that's like in the medicine circles. It's absolutely right. So for me, it's, it's really looking at the integral space of that individual. Are they just doing it because it's the trendy thing to do? And how do they walk that path? What is their relationship with their teachers? And what is their relationship to life? Um, and also preparation and integration for me is vitally important. And I think when you're looking at what is the difference between going to an Indigenous per person for a plant medicine ceremony or perhaps seeing um, a, a Western practitioner, I would say that the thing that I've noticed that's the difference is if someone is skilled in the integration and preparation process, a Westerner can understand a Westerner's viewpoint and the education that we've had and also the psych psychological components of what an individual may need to bring that ceremony into a space of holding and wholeness so that that person doesn't leave with, with themselves completely uh, ungrounded and not being able to make sense of that ceremony and more importantly not being able to implement that ceremony and what that individual has learnt on a daily basis into their everyday lives mm. yeah so well said couldn't have said it any better myself look at how that person is living their lives yeah uh, 100%. Totally, totally yeah well i mean well here's a question for you what what kind of challenges are you experiencing with this work I mean, you know, as a facilitator or, you know, a, a medicine woman, as we just spoke to, part of that role is to be grounded and centered and to hold a solid container, but it's also to be able to to walk the talk, to truly walk the talk with integrity. But that doesn't mean that the deep challenges don't come up as a facilitator. So I'm curious to know what kind of things that you're learning to navigate yourself or if there's anything that comes to mind that you have had to learn 
in, in recent times with, thought, with, with navigating, uh, holding these containers because, you know, people can lose their marbles, things can go awry, the shadows and the darkness can manifest in a myriad of ways. So what's your experience and your thoughts here? I think one of the most important things that I've learned is the importance of protection and knowing protection psychically. Not only with the container of the ceremonial space, and, and I hold a very strong ceremonial space, um, but also within the, the, the container of my own, own energy, energy because I'm such an empath that I've had to really learn to not, uh, for instance, if I'm facilitating a, a healing process for an individual in the, in the midst of a medicine ceremony, to understand how to navigate that world of the intangible and not fall into an individual's process so that I don't become um, swamped in, in whatever it is that they're, whatever that they're experiencing so that I can be most effective. Um, I'm going to tell you, darling, I hope I never, ever stop learning. I'm 50 years old now and I hope that when I'm 100, I'm still doing this work <laughs> And still rocking it, darling. And I know I will be. Um, I've got another half a century to go. Uh, Self-care practices for me are really important. I, I live a very, very simple and a very healthy life. Um, one of my um, things that I always do after holding a big, you know, week-long ceremony um, of ceremonies and rituals is I always go into nature. That's my go-to. I, I go into the ocean, I make sure that I eat well, I have downtime. I spend a lot of time on my own. I love my own company. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned to continue to simplify my life as I, as I grow in this path, as I grow older as a woman, as a medicine woman, as a facilitator. And um, through the challenges of life, I think that my capacity to have unconditional love and non-judgment has continued to grow as I, as, I, as I grow older. You know, when you're young, you tend to be a little bit arrogant and we think life is always going to go on forever. We never think about that things, you know, really bad things and challenging things can happen to all of us. And as you get older, they do happen. And they do happen to all of us. And... Um, you know, we learn, I've learned to become so grateful for everything, for the food, for the fact that I can live here in Mexico in this very unusual time that we're all living in, the fact that I can still do my work and feel and be abundant and and um, be of service is, is a, a great reflection of the work that I continue to do on myself. And I hope the good work that I continue to facilitate with others because, um, uh, as I said before, w without the, the participants, there is no ceremony. There is no path apart from my personal path. There is no work. So I'm forever grateful. And, uh, you know, um, I think you would know this too as well, darling. The more and more we step into this path, the less and less we can get away with things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. You know, we we come off just slightly and it's like boom. So um, I'm always uh, trying to be as conscious mm. as I can be in, in the way that I speak about myself, about others, the way that I process and um, and and continuing a very deep relationship with life and with nature and listening to the dream space and and continuing to open up to spirit mm -hmm. and to the the most important thing I've learned darling is to trust the process of life because nothing nothing is working against us everything in life is always working for us so I always go when one door closes I know another one is inevitably opening as long as I process well and so that I can step into that new path with, with an open heart and a, and a big fat yes to what that is. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah. I've, my body's got this very subtle buzz or glow because I'm just resonating with everything that you're saying. There's so many similarities within my own experience of life from 
deeply enjoying my own company and spending a lot of time by myself and living a simple life, you know, just really, really finding a deep reverence for those places of stillness and silence out in nature and listening. I just love being out in nature, listening such, you know, for me, there's almost nothing more. I don't even know what word to put to it just because there's just such a profundity just to something so simple. But, you know, to touch on some other things that you were speaking on, when you were speaking about empathy, I actually heard there's an MD at the moment and some of his videos are being shared because he's speaking about the current situation and he's talking about germ theory and terrain theory and his name is Zach Bush. I don't know if you've heard of him before. Of course. Ah, Cool. Okay. Well, in, (laughs) in one of his recent videos, he made a distinction between empathy and reverence. And when he said that, it really clicked into place for me because I've heard a lot of people speak in the past about almost kind of like glorifying themselves as being an empath. And to me, that was always kind of strange. It's like, why would you want to deeply feel someone's emotions all of the time? Like I totally get the mirror neurons and being able to feel, you know, having that heart to heart connection with people, but at the same time to be in that place of feeling that constantly, especially as a facilitator of medicine. You don't want to get sucked into the portal. You want to know what energies are yours and what energies are others and be able to navigate those spaces. But to be able to really approach everything from a place of deep reverence rather than being sucked into an emotional portal. uh, Yeah, that's just some reflections after watching his video and hearing you speak. I love that. And he's, Mm. he's probably one of the, I would consider one of the greatest hearts and most important figures in our contemporary world right now. And um, I'm so glad you mentioned him. Every time I listen to him, it's like music to my heart and music to my ears with with everything that Zach is sharing. I know Zach as if I know him. But, <laughs> you know. <laughs> totally, totally. Well, look, this is what we're talking about. It's the integration of the ancient and the modern. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Such a beautiful mm. light for mm. each of us. Uh, mm. um, so, if anyone hasn't watched Zach Bush uh, and, and any of anything that he's been sharing, please do yourself a favor and educate yourself and enlighten yourself. He's amazing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So, let's. I would love to go a little bit deeper down the retreat work. So. You know, one of the things that I'm just find totally inspiring about you is that you have such an expansive, extensive background in, you know, earth-centered, shamanic healing, transformational practices and modalities. And of course, it's only natural for there to be a cross-hatching, an integration, a blend of all these things that are going to inform how you conduct your work as you already spoke to. So I would love to know, and of course, sharing only what you feel comfortable sharing how do you like to work with Wachuma? Like, or perhaps how does Wachuma like to work with you? So what does your <laughs> ceremonial or ritualistic container look like? How did things tend to unfold? You know, you mentioned the Andean Mesa and the Andean altar, but yeah, expanding on from there, it might be nice to provide some context for the listeners. Beautiful, darling. So, um, so as you said, I, I have a, a very vast experience with different types of shamanic and earth-centered practices. So, so for me personally, I will, I will learn with all of my heart all of these practices, but then I always work with what feels the most appropriate for me. So in my Wachuma ceremonies, I hold a very, very strong container, just like the Red Road Path, but it's different. So I work with the Andean altar, and in the Andean altar, we open the direction of the south first. A lot of like with the with the red road, I know you open the east, which is the, the place of the rising sun. So in the Andean tradition, or in this particular altar that I work with, we open the direction of the south, then we go to the west, the north, the east, we go to Pachamama, the earth, the sky, and then we come back and we finish in the heart, in the centre. And with each of these doors, as we call them, uh, there I invite different energies, different ancestors, different points of focus for for the collective space of the ceremony and they the ceremony will typically go for about seven hours eight hours in the ceremonial context um i work with daytime ceremonies as well as evening ceremonies 
I find uh, personally, I have I don't have a preference for either the daytime or the evening, but I the the evening ceremonies tend to be incredibly potent because there's no distraction with people connecting in with nature or, or other things. Not that that's a distraction, but it can take people away from some very deep processes. Um, I, I work with my medicine drum, which is here, with my rattle, with bells. I, I come from a professional singing and dance background, so I use my voice very strongly in medicine ceremonies. I'm, I don't use medicine used medicine songs and I'll tell you why everything that I work with in this space is channeled I channel light language I channel uh, my music and my songs because I don't want people to be attached to the words that I'm sharing I want them to feel in their hearts what doorways and what pathways neural pathways as well as heart and psychic pathways I'm opening up so so literally in that moment I will have um energies come to me that I will channel through my music to facilitate whether it's an elevation of that energy uh, in the space or whether it's needing to clear out something from an individual, whether it's to remove an entity, for instance, or whether it's to um, channel a specific energy into that space. So for me, the musical component of the ceremony is incredibly important as to how uh, as a facilitator in that space, I manage that space because it's my responsibility. So, you know, people always say to me, why don't you sing traditional medicine songs? And I say, because they're not my songs. They don't come from my, my particular ancestral lineage. And, and uh, it's very important to me, as I shared before, darling, is that everything that I do is, is authentic to me and to nobody else. So, I may have learned a lot of things from other people and for, for all of my teachers, I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. But what I'm doing now is unique to me and to my energetic imprint and I will always keep it that way. Yeah, totally. I love that as well. And this has been a big part for me as well over the past, awesome. uh, you know, several years while I have, you know, utmost gratitude for all of the teachers and all of the different traditions and lineages that I have found myself kind of stumbling forth what is really resonating for me right now is learning directly from the earth it's not looking to the traditions or the ancestral lineages or the cultures that i don't come from but it's putting my ear down to the soil my other ear up to the stars and going what is my unique energetic signature and what wants to come through me in a way that is earth honoring it's not coming from any cultures it's coming directly from the earth that's what that's what i'm finding and you're doing these hand signals for people that are only listening. <laughs> yeah, in resonance, huh? I am fully, res there is no greater teacher, as you shared, Caillou, than, than the earth and then the stars and nature and our own connection to source. There is nothing beyond us, and I mean this with great respect. We have everything and that we need to know within us we just need to be still enough to listen to quote your words to what nature is trying to share with us and the best teacher is always always nature mm. uh beginning and the end it ends it begins with nature it ends with nature and and i i fully agree with you here this mm. is this has been my uh coming this has been my earth walk within this medicine path as well within the shamanic path as well mm. Yeah, well, while we're touching on ancestral lineages and cultural traditions, perhaps we'll open up a bit of a portal so that you can perhaps acknowledge and honour your own connection to the, your ancestral lineages. And as a bit of a preamble, I feel as though there's a, there's a collective sense of longing. And I think a lot of people aren't even aware of it. And it's a longing that has arisen due to all of this disconnection that we've spoken about with our earth. And, you know, it's... There's a very th a surface level connection to, to earth, but you know when it comes to our our ancestors and our cultural lineages, so many of us have been so void or so disconnected for so long and with the modern lifestyle and you know everything that comes with it, it's certainly not very conducive to reconnecting with these deep ancestral roots. And where are those roots? Well, obviously, as we've spoken to, they're deep down in the ground, they're connected to the soil, they're connected to Mother Earth. So connecting with deep ancestry, for me, 
is it's it's illuminating a path of being intertwined deeply uh, and connecting with the land in that way because if we go back far enough all of our ancestors were earth honoring ancestors so you know what do we got the internet social media the way that we market ourselves you know not to mention all the the collective bs that's unfolding right now it's all distracting us from the things that really matter and i feel as though it's kind of like a black hole or a gravitational pull that's just really really strong you know it, it becomes challenging for many to kind of swim out of the vortex and mm-hmm. it's like this vortex of technology and you know, I know this for myself as well. It has in the past been hard and to some degree it still is to fully give my heart and my soul back to the land. And I think because of that, because of this kind of tug of technology and doing these kind of things, having the conversations and using the computer and there's editing and so showing up on social media, all that kind of stuff. I think that kind of perpetuates this collective feeling of longing. You know, are you familiar with the ancient Greek word nostos? No, but I think I'm about to, Caillou. <laughs> <laughs> nostos. Yeah, yeah. It's You can think of Nostos as the great return home. It's the homecoming after a big, grand hero's journey adventure out into the world. So I, I know that the earth is calling all of us to come back home to to our roots, to, to her roots. So, you know, I guess just with all of that kind of brain spew that's come out, I'd love to know, like, what's this process been for you like how has it been for you connecting to your roots and your ancestral lineages and culture and how does it inform your life and all the rest of it I just want to acknowledge what you said because it was actually I, I didn't see it as a brain spew I think it's very it's vitally important what you shared Caillou and I am seeing everything that you shared all of us that are coming back to earth honoring and earth centered ways we are becoming the bridges the bridges between the ancient ways and the new ways between uh, understanding the importance of our connection to life and the importance of bringing bringing all of these ancient teachings into a modern context so that they're available for everybody. And as you said, um, each and every one of our ancestors across the world, from Asia to Europe to Africa to the Americas, we were all on earth honoring people before religion came in and um, literally systematically destroyed all of these old traditions. And in, in, uh, I I come from a very strong Hungarian lineage. We have gypsy in, in our back, in, in our background. I also have German in my background as well. Now I've particularly become very, very um, fascinated by the Taltosh, which were the ancient Hungarian shamans. And it was uh, uh, Taltoshism is the old religion of Hungary. And now they've, they've called it the um, Hungarian native faith. And it was revived in the 1980s after, you know, communist, communism fell down and the Austrian Empire and things like that. This was a very, very important part of our culture. And it was, um, I think it was the Christian King Stephen that actually bought Christianity brought Christianity into Hungary. And that's when all of the earth-centered practices, all of the shamanic practices that we share so strongly with the Native American people, as well as other cultures, um, began began to diminish because if you were seen practicing like everywhere in old Europe and everywhere in the world, any type of paganism or Wicca or or what was seen as shamanism, you were brutally tortured uh, or your family was threatened, or you were you were killed. So um, every Indigenous culture knows about this, and I think in some ways us Westerners have been given a really raw pill because we have been taken away from our own practices by our own kind. So it's this this insidious double um, uh, lie that was fed to us so for so long we've been so confused we haven't known you know was technology is technology our god is money our god is this what we're meant to be striving for is this what religion is meant to be all about um it's got nothing to do with the spiritual teachings of christ the 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 ascended master or any of these wonderful masters that walked our 
our earth and now have ascended. It's the, it's the, the, the human teachings around this uh, and killing in the name of Christ or Buddha or Krishna or Allah that I have a problem with because that is not the teachings of these extraordinary beings. That is what uh, people have used and governments have used and religions have used to control the people. And uh, it's time for each of us to go no more, no more. There is no higher truth than the one that we find, as you said, in nature. And this is why I believe that shamanism and paganism and all of these earth-centered practices are making an enormous revival because the time is now. We do not have time to waste. Uh, exactly what you said, look at what is going on in the world, this incredible fear and panic and uncertainty that we're living in. The only thing we can be certain of, Caillou, is that the old is dying. But what are we going to focus on and what are we going to continue to co-create together as powerful co-creators that we are and that's where my focus is now mm. yeah as you said that the witch hunt extends all across the globe and we're still seeing it now in the modern form you know even when it comes to just the most obvious of things when it comes to wholesome foods or natural practices it's it's mind-boggling to me that we are aspects of society are still demonizing the natural route. It's uh, well, well, just follow the money. They totally. they will always be our answer. Mm. I always say to someone, if you want to really see whether an organization or a government or a politician or a religious leader or anyone where their real interest lies, follow the money and you will have all your answers. There is no money in plant medicines for these, for, these, uh, for these corporations. They cannot make, they cannot patent it. So that's why they're afraid, but, and they should be, because there will come a time where, where I see that these medicines will, will work hand in hand with, with Western medicine, with, with um, allopathic medicine to really create something that is vastly different that supports each and every one of us physically mentally psychologically spiritually psychically and and we need to come together it's like the prophecy of the condor and the eagle the the union of the west the east and the west the union of the the, the mind and the heart this is the inner alchemy that we are we are seeing right now as well as the crumbling of the old structures and and a big ah uh, hole to that. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what is birthed through this time in amongst all of the suffering. And, and I have great respect and um, honour all of those people that are suffering and that are dying right now, um, uh, but also honouring those of us that are holding a vibration of a new frequency that is coming in. And this is the time we chose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another one of these ways in which you are holding and calling in this frequency is through another aspect of the work you're doing, which is this wild women's wisdom mentorship work. I would love to hear you speak on this. And it's becoming evident, I think, for many people why there's such an importance when it comes to this work, the re-emergence of the divide feminine, the wild feminine, you know, having women reclaim their power because for so long we've been going through these dark ages where man or the immature masculine has been holding the reins. And if we look back in many ancient cultures, it's obvious that the sacred feminine was revered in many ways and for many reasons. And when we zoom out and we look at the, the greater integration here, it's not just about women rising up in their power, but it's about men doing the same thing in their unique differences, but having them together to, to support each other in these potent, profound, sacred ways. So that's a large part of what you're doing and I would love to hear you speak a bit more to that. Hi, thank you so much, darling. And I agree with you. It's it's not men per se. It's the, the, the patriarchal system that has really, um, has really done us each over, both men and women. Uh, for me, it's really important right now that each of us connect with the with what I say is the energy of the sacred feminine, which is the energy of the earth, 
which is the energy of compassion and collaboration and community and tribe and all of those things that we continue to foster when we're in ceremonies and when we're doing sacred work, whether it's with plant medicine or not. I have always been deeply, um, I've always had very strong friendships with women. Uh, I, I love women and, and men, of course, as well. But right uh, from a very, very young age, I saw the disempowerment of women and the competition that was fostered through media, through trashy magazines, through gossip magazines, through advertising, and, and it really pitted women against each other. You know, the whole beauty industry, you know, having so many young women focusing on what they look like rather than the importance of their mind, their hearts, and what they're, what they're offering to the world has always caused me a lot of, um, well, a determination to change that story. So I've been working very deeply with women over the last, oh, 20 years of my life. I love that work. I love seeing women moving out of that space of a victim and, and realising that they have the power to change and to co-create every area of their life. And, um, and also to do that with another group of women has been incredibly liberating for many because we all have deep wounds with the feminine um, that need healing for various reasons. And so um, this work with women for me is very, very important because what I like to see and what I offer as part of this work is to ask the women that at some point they share their gifts and to at some point co-collaborate to create networks of grace, which is what Andrew Harvey in his book Sacred Activism shares so eloquently it is vitally important right now that women take their place in equal roles in society, in all areas of society, politics, uh, government, corporate, corporate corporations. I mean, in all areas, the discrepancy between the amount of men and women in those roles is ridiculous. So for me, the returning of a, a society that is much more focused on community and the well-being of each and every one of us is going to be when we continue to foster the uh, positions of women in key roles of, of, of government, corporations, religions, everywhere. That is our salvation. And when, when the Dalai Lama in his 2009 speech said that the, that the Western, it would be the role of the Western woman to save the world, I would say it's going to be the role of the Western woman to continue to deeply listen to what this world needs and to step up and stop waiting for anybody else to save us because you and me and all of our brothers and sisters right now, Caillou, that are really standing for strong as warriors and warrioresses of light, we are the ones that are going to create this change Nobody else is going to do it for us. So this is why I'm so passionate about women's work. And I, I grew up in a single parent family with a mother who worked two jobs to, to support my brother and I. So I have a deep respect for the resilience and the determination and the uh, strength and the power and the vision that my mother had to give us the best of everything. Yeah, what I'm reflecting on is, well, I'm a man, obviously. So what kind of message do you think is important for men to receive here and, and hold in relation to the work that you are facilitating and that you're encouraging women to do? And I get a sense, I know, I, I can feel into what the answer was. What, what, what that answer might be. I can feel what it is that wants to emerge within me, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I am very blessed to be surrounded by wonderful men in my life who really honour and respect women, who, who don't abuse their sexuality, even though they're in positions of power. Um, I would say it's vitally important for, for any man that is wanting to support uh, the movement of the sacred feminine and the rise of our young daughters, your daughter, my niece, all of these gorgeous young women, is to support 
their capacity to know that they can do anything that they want in life and that they have you by their side as the protectors, as the warriors, as the, these beautiful beings of light that protect life and protect women to continue to shine and to stand with them and, and just say, you can do this. I'm I'm here. I'm I'm behind you when you need. I'm beside you when I'm need. When you need, I'm going to be in front of you if you need me, at all to protect this space. But I will support you until you have reached your goal in any way that I can. And and I expect the the feminine to do that for the masculine as well. So it's it's a two way dance for me. Um, and uh, as I said, Caillou, people like you, people that are on this path. Uh, I, I see a really great returning to our roles in some way, their traditional roles. You know, all of this, this feminism that came out with Gloria Steinman and all these Steiner and all these women, in some ways it was a terrible distortion of, 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 of the beautiful roles of the feminine and the masculine and they're very specific roles. I always say that the man holds the strength while the woman holds the power. And together, when we work with those inner energies within ourselves and then we can see them birth within our lives in the way that is sacred and divine for life and pro-life, protecting our children, then we become a force that is unstoppable. Mm. Yeah, I love can I it. Ask you, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Please do. So what do you see the role of the masculine at this time in relationship to um, supporting the rise of this feminine consciousness within and without all of us? Yeah, well, as we've kind of alluded to throughout many of the themes in our conversation is that things are not one-dimensional or they're not on the two-dimensional plane. They are multi-dimensional in so many different ways. And to go back into what I was thinking when I asked you that question is that one of the ways in which we can support is to really connect with this divine feminine energy within ourselves and to come to know that on an embodied level. I think that's really important, just as it is for all males or females or, you know, however we choose to identify, to be able to know, to have an understanding, an embodied understanding of the masculine energies and the feminine energies and, you know, what they mean and what they feel like within ourselves. And also coming to an understanding of what the immature or the undeveloped aspects of what those are and you know like shining the spotlight on those areas within ourselves so that we can grow and mature and and you know I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to articulating this it's still a path that I am navigating and to be quite frank it hasn't been a large part of my path that is having to put language to this and you know it's interesting, a short side tangent. It's part of the reason why I've followed the call and let this creative endeavor to bubble up birdsong and to have these conversations is so that I can continue to learn and to keep exercising my ability to articulate things, to put language to things rather than be, you know, the strange hermit living in his isolated hut on the side of the forest or you know, riding the wild stallions on those boundaries between the wild and the civilized and, you know, to show up and to have these conversations. And, you know, I think intuitively a large part of my path has been tuning into things on an energetic level and then finding language for that. Because for me, uh, one of our brothers, uh, he has been on the show. He's the founder of the Flow State Collective, Juro Taylor. He brought something up many moons ago and he was talking about, what was he talking about? What does it mean to be a man? Because it's such a prevalent thing 
in today's society and and culture. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And I certainly know the importance of understanding those polarities and how they work together. But the focus for a large part of my life has been, rather than asking the question of what, what does it mean to be a man, it's been, what does it mean to be a good human being? Or, you know, different questions. I've just been asking myself different questions. How do I, what does it look like for me to be aligned to my, my vision, my purpose? What's my message? What's my mission? So I guess the focus has been on maybe we could say virtuous qualities rather than narrowing it in and saying, how do I be a man? And perhaps that's just, it's never really came, it hasn't come into my field of interest all that much. And I think the reason why is because I've come to an intuitive understanding of the polarities of masculine and feminine and haven't needed to spend a lot of time contemplating how to put language to it for my own experience through life. And maybe, maybe this is what, maybe this is an answer that I'm kind of getting to right now. And it's that, you know, working with energy is a core pillar of shamanism. And maybe we need to stop being, you know, this top-down model of approaching things with the head first. And, you know, I guess um, learning how to work with energies so it's not being so much up in our heads, but well, being up in our heads, thinking, what does it mean to be a man or what does it mean to be a woman and tapping back into the primal energies within. So, you know, learning how to work with the energies and to answer it in one way or another without spending too much time kind of fleshing out my thoughts here as I go, I think coming to an understanding of these energies on an internal embodied level is certainly one piece of the puzzle. Uh, I'm with you all the way, Caillou. I'm with you all the way. And I want to speak into the part of us that is each of us that is also constantly uh, navigating these spaces that are very difficult to articulate because we are living the dream. We are in every moment living the new earth, living the new world, living this new human what it is to be human and to continue to evolve. And uh, so in some ways it's very difficult to articulate because we're evolving at such a rapid pace right now. So I, I really love and I feel what you're sharing as well. So thank you so much. Yeah. And also for me, you know, hopefully I'm making some sort of sense here, but look, for me, it's such a foreign environment having these conversations, you know, the podcasting environment and having to think off the cuff is the name of the game in one way or another. And I'm a very reflective person and I've noticed within myself that I try to ask a lot of questions rather than pretending to have all of the answers. You know, I've done that in my past, pretended to have all of the answers and put on a facade to make it look like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm I've come to a place where I'm happy or I'm content of sitting in a place of the unknown and finding solace in that middle path of the unknown. And, but look, when it comes to me reflecting or when I'm looking to my partner or I'm looking to my daughter, you know, it's standing in a place where I'm grounded, I'm centered, I know my vision, I'm in my heart. I'm, and I'm always reminding myself to return to a place of encouragement and to hold a container where the doors are open and the stairs are ready to climb to really step up into their own power and to be able to step up into the sacred divine feminine energies the wild feminine energies to reconnect back to heart and soul and spirit and to the wildness of our animal fleshly sensuous being and you know it's the feminine it births everything it's the center for creation and for me what is important it's to nurture those seeds while standing in my own strength and doing what needs to be done to allow others to blossom from a place connected to heart and to soul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And um, 
very lucky they are to have you as a partner <laughs> and a daddy, uh, yeah, and I'm yeah. sure likewise as well. So yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Totally. Well, look, that went quick. An hour. It's. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It goes so fast. Do you think look, I well, can perhaps move out with a little sharing of a little song? Oh, Some I would love that. Before you do that, is there anywhere that you want to direct people? I'll have everything in the show notes anyway, but if you yeah. want to speak to any websites or anything where people can just yes. jump on straight away. Yes, so so my website is my name, beataalfoldi.com. That's B-E-A-T-A and then A-L-F for Freddie, O-L-D for Delta I.com. Um, I have some, we have some beautiful retreats next April here in, in Mexico and in Tulum. We have Jaguar Spirit, which is a Wachuma intensive from the 23rd to the 30th of April, 2021. And that is a really gorgeous retreat that is right on the beach with an amazing property that we've found. There's going to be Temescal, tobacco, all sorts of medicines and then I'm actually um, in the process of certifying um, a, a, doing a certification for people in shamanism and earth medicine. And so I'll be facilitating a retreat in Portugal from the 29th of August to the 5th of September in the Algarve Coast next year as well, as well as continued online work, not only with men, but with my women's work as well. So all those details, if people want to sign up to my newsletter, I spend a lot of time in, in crafting out good material, not just advertising what I'm doing, but crafting out material around personal development and self-awareness in my newsletters. So if people want to sign up to my newsletter, that would be awesome. Um, thank you so much for asking and, and thank you so much for having me and, and for us to share this moment. I hope we get to meet in person one day, Kayu. I have a feeling we will. I hope so too, Beata. Yeah, I would love for you to close up our space together with a song or some drumming or anything that you feel is appropriate. Well, how about I just work with my shakuppas because, you know, I've worked with online media enough to know that sometimes the drum just goes, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll, sure. I'll, keep, I'll keep it simple with the shakuppas and um, I think I might send a prayer to the children to all the children right now, to all the beautiful children on our planet as we navigate these times. Beautiful, Biana. Thanks once again for joining me on the show. Thank you so much, Caillou. So much love to you, brother. So much love. Thank you. Gracias, gracias, gracias.